Black WNST, Taos and Baltimore, and Baltimore positive. We are into baseball season around here. Got plenty to do with the Terps. We're going to get some Ravens and free agency in, but I've been tracking this guy. This guy's hard to get because he's, he's fishing somewhere all the time. You all remember him rocking back and forth in the dugout down in Atlanta, Fulton County Stadium, and, uh, and here in Baltimore for a very short period of time. He is a Marylander by birth. Uh, he admits it even, but he lives down there in South Carolina on the Georgia border, and he's having a good time and putting a brave into the Hall of Fame. Feels like every year. We welcome the man, the myth, the legend, Leo Mazzoni back to talk about sign-stealing, cheating, and how to build a Hall of Fame pitcher. What's going on, Leo? How are you, man? I'm doing great. Life is good on Lake Hartwell, and uh, I'm helping out uh, a special consultant to the Furman University coaching staff, and uh, uh, they have a great coaching staff there at Furman, and uh, and I enjoy working with the coaches and uh, doing radio shows across the country, pitching seminars, and uh, a lot to do with healthy arms and uh, the concern of uh, Tommy John surgeries now are 52% uh, age 19 and under. Man, there's a lot of uh, for a guy my age to bitch about with baseball, right? You know, uh, Aparicio's right. on the back of my jersey. Uh, baseball came into my life the minute I was born. It's the reason yep. I'm here. It's how I wound up in Baltimore uh, when my cousin played here in the mid '60s and brought my father over from Maracaibo. Um, I, I, what's going on in baseball right now? And I don't know from the rules, from the analytics, from the way I sit in the upper deck and shortstops aren't playing shortstop anymore, and left fielders aren't playing left field anymore and that's the basic part of it i sit here with luke every day and we talk saber metrics and we talk about uh, uh you know the the, the videos and, and all, all all that goes into it and then we hire the guys from houston because they're geniuses right they're they're going to transform the orioles because they're mm -hmm. geniuses um and, and and then this happens i I haven't talked to you since the beginning of all of this. I've had every Greg Olson on and old pitchers, and I hear Ben McDonald, and I've heard what Ripken has to say about it, and I've heard what's on you know MLB Network. But we're now getting into the nitty-gritty of these guys getting into batter's boxes who clearly stole a World Series. And, you know, I wonder, wonder how a guy like you would feel about it. You've always been pretty outspoken, you know? <laughs> well... Uh, you know, number one, uh, that I, I read, a, saw a headline one time that I think perfectly uh, uh, fits the situation as far as analytics. And that is that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, analytics is holding baseball hostage. And uh, basically, I, I feel that way because the sign stealing and the Houston bringing in people to figure this stuff out, or however they did it, it's taken it to a whole new level. And it, and and. Uh, it, I don't like it whatsoever. I mean, uh, it wasn't right. Uh, when you take it to that kind of level, then it, cha it changes everything. Now, sure, we had fun trying to steal signs from a third base coach, right? Or we tried to uh, read something from a pitcher. Or we, you could look at the defense, and if the defense shifted early, you could give, give, uh, try to uh, give location to your hitter. The runner from second base trying to give location to his hitter. All these things. <clears throat> but we thought that was, you know, gamesmanship. That's not... That's just part of the lore, uh, fun of baseball, you know. We knew and kind of find out in 91 in the World Series, you know, when, when we were playing the Twins, when we were hitting in the Metro Dome, the flags were blowing in, and when the Twins were hitting, it was, they were straight down. <laughs> well, but, you know, you, you, la you know, you laugh about that. Uh, you know, the shot heard around the world. Somebody, you know, they say Bobby Thompson knew what was coming, and Ralph Branca said he, he, that he knew that too, so... You know that, but this is a different level. This is completely different. Well, where you know, does it go from being shady to corking your bat? Where does it go from I took special vitamins and drank milkshakes to uh, and got B twelve shots? Wink, wink. To what happened during the era you were, you know, in, you right, were involved right. in the game? I mean, I, yeah, I've talked to bullpen pitchers that say every bullpen in Major League Baseball had a crooked bullpen for the visiting team because they wanted you to come in and throw crooked. You know, that, <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard all of this, right? And the uh -huh. baseball's juice. And we're scuffing the balls, well, and Mike Scott absolutely. was scuffing the balls, and I, I, I don't know where it, baseball's always had a little edge about where cheating is and where wink, right. wink. I'm stealing your signs, right? Well, you know this. This though, the technology that has come in is this is definitely uh, 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 brought about a, a change in the game. I mean, uh, uh, and, it, and a lot of this is going on by people that never played the game. 
and and a lot of this is going on, you know, where people think they're smarter than everybody else. You know, I, I watched a game the other day, and uh, uh, Furman's playing a team from North Carolina, and he got cue cards, sending the cue cards to the pitcher from the dugout. Cue cards, and each card had a number on it. The pitcher would look into the dugout for the cue cards, then he'd look on his wrist and read the wrist and didn't make a pitch. And I got so upset, I hollered, what's behind door number two? <laughs> but anyway, that that's the analytics of it. As far as drawing, nobody has the answer as far as drawing the line where you cheated and where you didn't. But, you know, uh, you know, I, I was coaching during the steroid era, and, you know, it, a lot of times that stuff never even entered my mind. Now, the, the, the cork bats in, in Chicago did, but uh, uh, the other things never entered my mind, and there weren't, there weren't any rules in place. Now there's rules in place for the, for the steroids and everything else. Now we've got to have to have rules in place for technology. Because, the, you know, if you're setting up cameras, let me, i, I got to ask you a question, though. How the hell can you not hear somebody beating on a, 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 a can in the dugout on the other side? Well, obviously, it, it, it goes on for three games, and you go into town, and you come out of town. And, I mean, we've heard Belichick, you know, the, the legend of New England, when you go into their visiting locker room, uh, you know, there are coaches who would swear the place has been bugged and that, that, <laughs> they, that they knew things were coming before they were coming. And right. uh, the, the Astros thing, look, the beating on the trash cans, I saw all of that with John Boy out on Twitter back in November. But the thing that blew my mind, Leo, it didn't even happen until January. It didn't happen until after Christmas, after some of the penalties were handed down, that, that, that when, when Altuve crossed third base to grab his jersey and then came right. out with a different jersey, at that point... I'm like, wow, we're we're in a whole different level when we're right. buzzering uniforms on fastball curveball, right? Well, well, I'm going to tell you what, you know, as a pitcher, <clears throat> that would certainly upset me because, you know, if if you know what's coming, you can spit on a breaking ball and a changeup and sit on dead red. I mean, uh, unless unless they hang it, you know, and then you can, then you can do it. But you know, you basically teach a, a pitcher to start your breaking ball and your changeup in the strike zone and finish off finish out of the strike zone. That's how you get your swings and misses. So if you know it's coming, you can just spit on the darn thing, and that's a huge advantage for a hitter. And uh, but then there also, I learned in my, my in my career, there's a lot of hitters didn't want to know what was coming. David Justice did not want to know what was coming. You know, I mean, um, but that was because. We would find out that the pitchers were tipping their pitches. Kurt Schilling used to tip his pitchers, and we still couldn't hit tip his pitches, and we still couldn't hit them. <laughs> you know, I mean, Chipper Jones told me one time. He goes, "It's the damnedest thing, Leo." I said, "What's that?" He goes, "I know everything that's coming, and I still can't hit him because he was showing that he was tipping uh, he was tipping the pitch when he was going to throw his fastball. You can see more of the ball coming out of his glove earlier. So, but these are things that all hitters and players look for." But when you start setting up TV cameras and you start doing this, I can't stand that. I I, I don't like technology anyway. Hell, I still I'm talking to you on a flip phone. <laughs> Leo Mazzoni <laughs> joining us from a flip phone somewhere yeah, right. uh, in the, the South Carolina lakes and Lake Hartwell down there near my mother's uh, homeland down in Abbeville, South Carolina, and uh, pr probably feeding off Clemson's uh, football uh, down there as well as Furman and helping out with the uh, the, the the baseball program. So when young people come. Come to you at Furman and start talking about cheating and steroids, and you're they have to bring this all of this up with you, right? Like you're the sage guy with all the Hall of Famers and all of that to say, how can this be going on as a fan and and from the leadership aspect of this from a front office? And Leo, I, I'm assuming you were in on some hokey pokey from here and again and st tipping pitches and stealing pitches. I mean, everybody in baseball is in on all of that. But when they come to you as one of the sage guys, if you're still in the game and you're a 60-year-old pitching coach and you find out that guys in the dugout are wiring themselves, banging on trash cans, Bobby Cox knows about it, right? Like, that, that the manager's in it. Th this is the where it really gets really slippery for me as far as where the grown-ups are in any of this. Going back to your era where guys were running off to the Caribbean and taking funny shots and, you know, guys are 30 pounds of mass muscle from the time you see them in October from, to the time, time you see them in February down in Florida. Stuff was going on and nobody says anything, but the Astros thing about how we're now going to hang the managers, the managers were a part of this, but the players are just going to, like, stand in the batter's box and play. I'm really concerned for 
what Major League Baseball, the owners, Manfred, what they're really going to do about this because you know as well as I do, this is going to be a really ugly season for policing itself because players are really pissed about this. Well, that's the difference. Players are upset. Now, as, as far as discussing that with anybody, I haven't discussed it only with like uh, when we have a conversation with coaches or, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to young people, they want to know how Maddox threw a pitch or how Glavin threw a pitch or how Eric Bedard threw a pitch or Jeremy Guthrie threw a pitch. And those are the things that I think are most important to talk about. How to keep your arm healthy, how to take care of your elbow and, and avoid Tommy Johns and to stick that term velocity up your you know what, <laughs> you know, and, um, uh, because that's a joke, too, in baseball. <clears throat> the baseball terminology and the technology has made it a joke. And I don't like, this, I don't like, I don't like all the mustard that you see out there either with, with players, uh, the way some of them go crazy when they hit a home run or somebody goes crazy when they strike somebody out. I don't like any of that. You know, I don't like rubbing it in on to somebody else. I don't like somebody shooting their mouth off after they hit a home run or beating their chest and all that sort of thing. I don't like any of that stuff. You know, and, and uh, you know, I was talking to Goose Gossage in Cooperstown, and Goose said that, uh, uh, you know, he wouldn't last now. He said hey, he would drill everybody to come up there, you know, if they're going to if they're going to bat flip, you know. And now, and then baseball puts on their TV shows the ten best bat flips. You know what I'd like to do with those bat flips to the directors that are putting that on the air? That's a joke. But any and so is technology when it comes to stealing signs. That's a joke. The other stuff. You know, I never saw steroids when I was coaching because it never entered my mind, and I was ignorant to the fact that, you know, I just thought somebody was working out or they were just big and strong and fine. We were going to pitch. All I cared about was what our pitchers did. I didn't care about what was going on around me. But the policing part of this for in 2020, I'm talking about, right here, right now, for what they're doing to clean it up, um, right. I, I, I'm gravely I think, concerned I it, about sort of uh, pu- the public perception and the public trust of all of this for the players having immunity, which you can say well, you have immunity, but then you got to go play baseball and you don't have immunity right. there, right? No, no. You, you know, you, you, you police your own uh, uh, club, that's for sure. That comes from the players. And, uh, but you know what? And if you start drilling guys, you know, and this sort of thing, then that that's going to get your your butt in a bind. The one that's drilling somebody, you know, or sending a message. I think there's been seven or eight Astros hit already in spring training, if I'm not mistaken. And that's not shocking. And, <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, you know, they're, and they're going on down to first base because they know it, <laughs> you know. But I think you know when you're talking about suspending, you know, if the manager was in on it, or the front office is in on it, they know what's going on, or they're blinded by it, whatever, or they don't pay attention to it. You know, I've seen that happen, too. You know, I mean, look what happened to, <clears throat> you know, some uh, the manager in Houston, you know, or the, in the, uh, the manager in, 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 in uh, Boston. And But then what surprises me is it's hard to imagine the coaching staff, if the managers knew about it, the coaching staff didn't, you know, the, the, the coaching staff that didn't. <clears throat> the other thing is, is that, you know, maybe you get caught up in the competition and every edge you want to win, and that's basically what happened. Well, they got caught. Now... You're not gonna. I don't think you're gonna see it anymore. I don't think you're gonna see uh, the technology involved in stealing signs anymore because it's been put out there that it's been caught, and the players are upset about it. And if the players are upset about it, that's going to be eliminated. And Manfred, everybody's on him for well, you didn't do enough. You didn't, well, you know what? These the, the, there's the, there's managers that lost their jobs, or general, uh, general managers lost their jobs. There's some front office people, and the bottom line is this: now they know that they can lose their jobs if they get caught. Before, everybody thought they could get away with everything. It's like anything else, you know, until you get caught. (laughs) Well, guess what? Steroids got caught. Okay, that's been eliminated. Okay, technology got caught. Now that's going to be eliminated. And any any time that anybody tries to get an edge, there's going to be a whole conspiracy theory out there, and somebody's going to get fired. So now that everybody knows that, then that, that stops. Marylander Leo Mazzoni joining us here in Baltimore on WNST today, and uh, he's down in Lake Hartwell enjoying a life in semi-retirement, also working with the Furman baseball program down there as a special advisor, uh, teaching him how to throw it like Maddox and, uh, uh, and certainly uh, <laughs> maybe hit it like Smoltz. Who knows, right? Hey, uh, for, from the changes to the game, when you put the game on, 
relief pitchers, finishing innings, uh, not being one and done, the lefty-lefty matchups that we've right. come to know as baseball over our lifetime, not to mention the shifts. We're going to lose 100 games here in Baltimore this year. No one's going to the games. we got two years left on a lease here in Baltimore. We have all mm -hmm. sorts of issues uh, going on. But the biggest issue is putting the game on at some point this summer and saying, I don't know who these players are, which a lot of that's going on, but I don't even understand how the game's played anymore or managed, and why is that guy pitching to that guy in this circumstance? Oh, he has to now because he has to face three batters. It's, it's really, this is going to take a little getting used to, especially for young old-timers like you and me that ain't never seen baseball played like this. Well, you know, and it's not that we're old-timers, it's just that, you know, the first thing I thought of was now that you're going to have one pitcher has to face three hitters, unless it's the last hitter in the in the inning, then you can change over. <clears throat> is it's going to be very important as a former pitching coach to make those guys understand that a straight change is going to be have to be be absolutely necessary as part of your assortment. Why is that? Because when when I was coaching, I did everything I could to have our setup guys. Uh, learn to improve a straight change because that negated lefty, lefty, righty, righty matchups. You know, for example, if you had a Mike Remlinger who was a left hander, he was a setup guy for us for eight uh, for four or five years in Atlanta. He come up with a straight change, and we couldn't wait for the team to pinch hit a right hander in the eighth inning with it when we had the lead. So it's and I'm thinking, well, you know what? I was already ahead of the game because now that you have to face three hitters. And you're trying to, uh, you know, get an advantage in a matchup. That straight change has to come into play. That gives you an advantage, and you got to be able to teach that pitch to somebody, and then have them trust it. Because if you don't, you know, you could be in for some long innings. I mean, what if you come in and walk the first two guys, and you can't take them out? You know, I mean, uh, it's 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 silly. It's all about this speeding up the game and all this other BS, you know. And speeding up the game. <clears throat> Speeding up the game is is has been talked about for years, but nobody's ever changed a rule about it. But I'll tell you what: when I was a youngster and I went to a game at the old ballpark in Memorial Stadium in Baltimore or Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, you know, and when it, when I was a youngster and the game was over, I was pissed. <laughs> I well, thought it went. I thought it went too fast. Well, I mean, they did go pretty fast back then. You go back and look yeah. at the box scores, and you know, I was back looking at the '73 playoffs and Palmer and Vida Blue. You know, hour and forty-eight minute baseball games. You know, crazy. Well, absolutely, Maddox and Schilling. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Glavin and, and Johnson, Smoltz and, and uh, Kevin Brown. All those games did that too. You know, but here's the thing. <clears throat> now the analytics is getting involved. So you got to pitch this guy here, pitch this guy here, pitch this guy here. You know. When if you can't command a fastball, you can shove that out the window. You can shove that out the window if you can't command a fastball. Then you can go to an area where the analytics say he may be vulnerable. But if you can't command a fastball, everybody's getting behind in the count. <clears throat> Excuse me. Everybody's getting deep in the count. And it's all swings and misses. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Then when you hit a ball, it, it, it's out of there. Don't tell me that ball's not jacked because it is. You know, and then the right, then they, the, here's the radar gun. Oh, he's throwing 95. No, he's not. He's throwing 90. Oh, he's throwing 97. No, he's not. He's throwing 91 or 92 because they don't time the ball coming across home plate anymore. They time it coming out of their hand. That's exaggerated five miles an hour. <clears throat> and then what's happening with kids? You don't make a club unless you can hit a certain number on a radar gun. You're traveling all-star teams, all this. What's happening? Tommy John surgeries. Because if the kids are being told that by these idiot coaches with cue cards, <laughs> you know, that you have to hit a certain number on a radar gun to make our team, what's he going to do? What's that youngster going to do? He's going to try to jack it up. And when he tries to jack it up, he's vulnerable to Tommy John surgery. And it's not a curveball. Or it's not a breaking ball that hurts your arm. It's not a change-up or a split that hurts your arm. It's you trying to throw as hard as you can on every pitch. And now in the major leagues, oh, well, I'll try to get five in and turn it over to the bullpen. That makes me want to throw up. You know? And, they're gonna, and, abuse, and relievers in the major leagues, they're getting abused like crazy. You know what third time around the lineup means? That means a, a manager takes the pitcher out because he's covered his ass. Because the analytics say he might give up a run. Well, over the course of a nine inning game, you might give up a run or two. And if that's it, you pitched a hell of a ball game. But now you give up a run, you're taken out after throwing a shutout or have no hitters going now in the sixth and seventh inning. Then I had an interview 
an interview with a bunch of uh, professional coaches. I won't name the team. And they were talking about pitch counts. And I said, well, how many of you all know what a max out inning is? And they go, what? I said, you don't even know what a max out inning is, do you? I said, for example, Bobby Cox or even Sam Perlazzo in, in Baltimore, they'd say, he'd say, Leo, you gonna, is the pitcher going to max out this inning? I'd say, yes. If he matched out that inning, that means he wasn't pitching the following inning after, you, after the fifth, okay? Now, if he wasn't going to max out, then it didn't matter what the pitch count was. He wasn't coming out. And everybody looked at me like, oh. I said, well, don't you think the amount of effort you put forth every inning – is going to matter on, on more important than your pitch count? What if you're cruising with a high pitch count or you're laboring with a low pitch count? You can do, that's certainly possible. But when you max out your effort, the, t- the inning that you pick to max out your effort, you know the guys would come to me. You know, a guy like Eric Bedard, I got one inning left, Leo. Okay, we'll have somebody ready. Maddox, I'm good to go. Okay, or uh, you know, Glavin, I feel great. Okay, you know, one time he said, I feel great. He had you know. 100 pitches after seven innings. Well, who cares? He was going nine. You know? Kent Merker threw a no-hitter in his very first start in 1994 against the Dodgers because he was a fifth starter, so we rolled it over. Now we're in L.A. His very first start, he's got a no-hitter going after six innings. He goes, I think I'm getting tired. I said, what are you, nuts? <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? I said, he says, what do you mean? I said, well, look up on the scoreboard. He goes, oh, I'm not tired anymore. <laughs> you know what he did? He threw a no hitter. He threw 129 pitches. Nine of them, 90 of them were fastballs, and he pitched 17 years after that. Because he, what, he, when you when you have that adrenaline going and you feel good, you're okay. You know, there's more injuries now than there's ever been. You know, and guys aren't even pitching much. That's the problem. And then the other thing is your minor league systems are being run by a group of, a group of nerds that are taking innings pitched away from your pitchers and they never learn how to pitch. Leo, you're giving me gospel today, man. I got you on the right side of, uh, of the lake today before we're going well, fishing. Well, I mean, it, it, it kind of insults your intelligence. Let me tell you something. You want to hear something like phenomenal. You got me rolling now. Yeah, I do have you rolling. You know, I, 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 I'm just going to have a drink of my Liberty Pure Water and let you go. There go you go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Now, I, I was put in the, uh, uh, the City of Atlanta Sports Hall of Fame last year, okay? Now, when they introduced me, Greg McMichael and Charlie Liebrand, a couple of pitchers that I had, when they introduced me, they said, from 91 through 93, okay, Atlanta Braves starters made 537 starts and missed one. Okay? Missed one. Then over the 15-year run in Atlanta, Atlanta Braves starters averaged making 146 of the 162 game scheduled starts. Averaged. In Baltimore, you had Eric Bedard with a chance to break the Orioles strikeout record for a season and win in 15 games. The only thing that happened in Baltimore is we didn't have enough, we weren't given enough time, even though you won 70 some, well, 71 games, which seems like to be a, the way it is now. That, well, that's that, another that's phone call. Year. Leo, I mean, I, I can rewind you on the, 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 the insanity of Baltimore baseball over my lifetime. It's, I mean, we're, we're, I was going to wind you up and get you going uh, to, to Atlanta. And while you're in Atlanta, you're telling me stories from Atlanta. You know, they've moved that team out to the suburbs, and it's rejuvenated everything, right? Like, well, the, if, the, if the you Braves look, you see you look, is different than what you left, right? Right, right. Well, it's it's. Uh, uh, the ball carries a little more in the new ballpark, but it, you know, here's the thing: the ball. What was Atlanta Fulton County Stadium? What, what was it called? The launching pad. The launching pad. You'll never get any pitching in the launching pad. Oh, really? We kind of dispelled that myth, you know. <laughs> Camden Yards is easier to hit a home run in than most any ballpark in the big leagues, you know. But the bottom line is, when Atlanta moved, what happened in the way the, way the game is now? When Atlanta moved. They moved to an area where they have built a whole city around their ballpark. In other words, you can go to the ball game now and never go into the stadium. You got hotels looking into the stadium. You have uh, uh, all kinds of wonderful restaurants and and uh, pubs and anything you need is there within walking distance to inside the stadium and outside the stadium. You know, you have the Roxy Theater right there. You have six eighty the fan moving all their radio station equipment and everything right there. Uh, in 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 uh, I call it SunTrust Park, but you know, and and so uh, Battery Way, you know, they call it now, and it's absolutely beautiful, you know. 
So therefore, you have the people can go to, and in the winter time, when there's like I used to, I do some radio shows on a Saturday in the winter time there, and go down to the station. Well, the the the, the, the battery's part; it's packed. People are having Bloody Marys at ten o'clock in the morning. Everybody's barbecuing or whatever. Even if it's cold, they're out there. That place has people in it, and that's and it and it's it's. Uh, they built it's a, a community beat. around a baseball franchise, literally. Absolutely, right, yeah. right, right. You know, and I the, I remember the first time I saw that was at Coors Field, where they built a community around you know around Coors Field. You know, but I've always felt that Baltimore with the Inner Harbor would be you know a, 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 it was beautiful. You know, I live. I, so. I, I'm sitting here right now in the middle of the Inner Harbor. Leo, man, we got to get you back up here at some point and uh, continue to talk some baseball. I hope you're having a good time, Dan. You enjoying life in retirement? I know, uh, you know, Bobby Cox had some health challenges. Uh, how's Sammy P yeah. doing? Is Sam, Sam doing all right? Yeah, Sam's doing fine. He's he's working as an infield instructor with the Minnesota Twins, and they respect the heck out of him. They like him in the minor leagues. In spring training, they're both. They want him in the big leagues. They want him in the minor leagues. They want him in the big leagues. So he's doing fine with Minnesota, well respected, and um, uh, Bobby Cox is recovering from a stroke. Uh, I've been down to see him about six or seven times. I go down every two weeks. It's about a two-hour drive to get to his house from where I'm at, from from Lake Hartwell. But he's hanging in there. It's gonna. It's a long haul, but he's hanging in there, and I get him laughing, and that's the most important thing we can do for him right now is get him laughing. So. And I do. I miss the game. Absolutely, I do. Do I get upset? Bobby told me he goes, "We wouldn't last two weeks now, Leo." <laughs> well, you know what? I spent a couple of days with a mutual buddy of ours. John Sherholz was back here, uh, yeah. right around my birthday. We do a thing called Baltimore Homecoming here. I mean, we're really trying to bring the community together. I do a thing called Baltimore Positive, uh, and I got to I got to check in with John. I I owe him a phone call. You know, his name's on the stadium up in Towson. A famous Baltimorean and a guy that really oh, yeah. has Baltimore at heart. Uh, you know, coming back here and, uh, and telling stories but man the Sherholz tells the story I mean you guys really built something special down there I mean you I, I'm sure once or twice a year used to be up in Cooperstown you get together I'm sure the Braves have you all back uh, and you get to see old friends but uh, it oh, is yeah. an amazing legacy what the Atlanta Braves have done over three decades right from Ted Turner what, on right oh yeah Ted Turner was awesome awesome owner and you know what though you had stability in the front office you had you, Ted was the owner who who, gave, who, who who didn't meddle in with what was going on. Then you had Stan Cast, and then you had John Sherholtz, and then you had Bobby Cox. You had a coaching staff that remained intact, and you worked with the farm system to make sure that your minor league teams were doing the same things that you wanted your big – that they so that when they got to the big leagues, for example, the pitching programs that I used in Atlanta used in the – and, and, and they used in the minor leagues so that when I got a pitcher that came up, they knew exactly what was going to go on, how much they were going to throw, how much they weren't, et cetera, and make an easier adjustment for it. In Baltimore, you had none of that. Everybody's just all going their own way. And, and you had stability, and you knew that if you walked into that clubhouse and didn't act a certain way, you were gone. For example, if you, were in, if you walked into a, the, the Braves clubhouse and you, you, could, hear, you could hear guys talking, because Bobby Cox had a rule, you can put you can play any type of music you want, as long as you put headphones on. You walk into Camden Yards Clubhouse, you can't hear yourself talk, you know. And then the and, and then and so and then being on time on the field, making sure everything's organized, making sure this, making sure that, you know. I mean, it was it was a it was a tremendous awakening for me when I saw the difference between the two. And uh, the only sad part that I regret is that Sammy and I didn't have a little more time to get it going, you know, as far as uh, developing and, and uh, starting to win. I mean, just let's face let's think, you know, everybody was upset because when we had Daniel Cabrera, he was only 9 and 10 or 10 and 11, whatever the hell he was. You know, for two years he was, I mean, what happened when we left? He's, he, he disappeared somewhere. Well, you know? I mean, I could go through all of the arms back to Rocky Coppinger all the way through, right? And all the pitching coaches in between. And my dearly oh, departed God. friend, Mike Flanagan, who uh, I always honor him with the Cuba Orioles uh, poster up on my wall that was his. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's been a, it, Leo, it's been an absolute tragedy to watch Camden Yards open on that day when Rick Sutcliffe opened at 92 to realize yeah. we're now in year 29, uh, you know, of this and we're going to lose 100 games.
games. No one's coming to see the team. They, they just put their tickets on sale about three weeks ago. They don't even put their tickets on sale. It's, it, it, it's, it's mind-blowing. But, uh, dude, I want you to fish. I want you to think good thoughts about baseball. I want Furman to go undefeated here. I want coronavirus to stay away from Lake Hartwell, all right? Furman's 8-8. Eight eight. <laughs> <laughs> They've already lost. Larry, 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 right now, and I'll, just to let you know, when I go out on the boat, I don't fish. Oh, you don't? I kind of okay. like to – no, I don't fish. What I like to do is go out on the boat and ice down a cooler and relax. Relax. I got you. Okay, well and – I, And I, you know what? I got some – and I still have a little uh, – some Natty Bows. Well, I mean that, that 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 makes it local. That always it always tastes better on a lake too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I you know and I got I got the Natty Bow flag flying. I have so uh, you know and uh, do you and uh, yeah, so it's pretty cool because uh, 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 Todd Smith, who used to give us our cars when I was coaching there. He and his wife became real good friends with Rebecca and I, and we see each other all the time. Well, I would say if you have anything like a Natty Bow thing up on your boat, you will attract Ravens fans at some point on <laughs> Lake Hartwell. Somebody in Lamar Jackson jersey will be coming up. Always great to visit with you. We don't do it too often. I, I will not be calling you about pennant race baseball this summer, Leo, unfortunately. Oh, you so, know what? You never know. You never know. I mean, but, you know, yeah. Know. You, gotta, you, gotta, you kinda know on this one, though. <laughs> Be they, well, you know, man. I, I tell you what, did you look at the Orioles' schedule coming out of the gate? Oh, Yankees. Yeah, I got oh, you. My, it's crazy. Oh, my God. I mean, the first the first 10 or 11, 12, or, I mean, Yankees, Red Sox, Cardinals. I mean, whoa. Well, here's the damnedest thing. It used to be we'd open a season in April. We wouldn't be buried till May. Now we're going to open a season in March. We'll be buried in April. So, um, <laughs> March 26th, we're playing baseball. It's crazy, Leo. Take care of yourself. I Always know. great to visit with you. And, uh, you got it. We'll, we'll, we'll come down with some crab cakes and, uh, and some Natty Bow for you, all right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I would love some crab cakes. You got it. Leo Mazzoni joining us here from Lake Hartwell in a spirited discussion about the state of the game of baseball. Oh, I wish I could be more optimistic about those things. That's why I keep Don Moeller around here in Baltimore Positive. He'll keep you positive about 100 losses and turn them into 94 losses for you this year. Nasty at WNST.net finds me. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram. Baltimore Positive Alive and Well, Sheila Dixon, Frank Kelly, Ted Venatoulos. And next week, we'll be talking with Barry Glassman from uh, Harford County and Harford County Executive as well out at State Fair and at Fateley's down at Lexington Market. We are WNST.net, AM 1570 and WNST Baltimore Positive. And we never stop talking. Baltimore Sports.